it's about time to get started tonight. I appreciate everyone showing up. Uh, we've got Brother Zach Holmes with us tonight from the Wellette Congregation. He's going to give us an update on the India work that we support. Uh, Brother Zach got to make his first trip this year, so I'm sure he's got some exciting things uh, to tell us. Uh, before we begin with a prayer, I've got a note here. It says, please have a special prayer for Justin Demps, who was injured in an automobile accident earlier today and was airlifted to Erlanger. Now, this is the brother of Kathy Whitaker. Also, Don told me brother B.J. Clark's wife, Tish, has found out she has a brain tumor uh, and she's going to have to have surgery within the next month or so. So I remember her in prayer, too. If you would, bow with me. Lord, we're thankful we can be here tonight. We're thankful uh, for this congregation and us being able to gather together. Father, we just pray for Justin Demps that was injured in the automobile accident. Father, we just pray that you be with him, be with the doctors and nurses, and Father, help him to recover and get his health back. Be with Sister Clark and uh, with the brain tumor. Father, we just pray that the doctors will, will know how to treat it and that she can be well once again. Father, be with both of their families and Comfort them and bless and be with Zach tonight and as he talks to us about your work. Thank you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. Very excited to be here again this evening to talk to you about what's going on in India. I don't really have any slides on it, but I will tell you about a month ago there was some severe flooding. They received heavy rainfalls, and there are two main rivers in the northern part of the area in which we work, and those rivers overflowed, and it was very detrimental. There were 17 villages underwater at one point. 14 of those Christians lived in those villages. We don't know of anyone who lost their life. They were able to evacuate many people beforehand, but there were some who were stuck in their homes and their villages as the floodwaters continue to rise. In India, when you're not able to get out and go to the market or go to work that day, you may not eat because they don't have pantries. Some places, no, there's no electricity, so there's no go to the freezer and let's see what we have in there. So if you can't get out of your home, you can't eat. And so some efforts were being put forth where they could get the large church van, the bus to drive into a flooded area. They would bring food and water in. And in other locations, it simply was a wooden canoe, and they paddled back into the villages, and they took bags of water and what food they could send. We have been able to send about $60,000 in flood relief, and we're hoping to maybe uh, obtain some more because there were church buildings that were damaged. There was an orphan's home where the water was up to the top of the doorway, and the children lost everything they had. The beds are gone. What little clothes they had were gone, their school supplies, and some of those have since been replaced. They've given those children the things they need. An or a widow's home was damaged, church building, and so it's untold the amount of damage and the dollar amount. And so we were very thankful for brothers and sisters and congregations who have been able to help and send funds for that. And we ask for your prayers that that flood relief, which is going to take some time, even though the waters had received, have receded, you understand and know when it becomes to a natural disaster that it takes much longer than sometimes we think. And so we ask for your prayers on their behalf and your consideration in helping in what, which ways we can there. I titled the presentation The Fruits of India because when we went in April, there were no crops on the ground. It was way too hot. It was over 100 degrees every day when we were there in April we flew in at 9.30 at night to the Delhi airport, and they said it is a cool 96 degrees. They weren't joking, because during the day, it could be upwards to 120 degrees. So there's no rice in the field, so many, many people in the villages won't be working in the rice field, so the rice has been harvested, but there are plenty of fruit trees, countless numbers of fruit trees. It may seem chaotic and organized as you ride from village to village. You're riding along the road, you look out there, and you say, well, there's people out there by those trees, and then you realize those trees are in rows, but not like we would have it here. We would be very clean, and everything would be cut and mowed around, but there, no, the trees are planted, and they're out there in the fields working. And there were so many fruits, and I couldn't help but think of the several times in Scripture where Jesus uses fruit to teach a lesson. And so we'll focus our attention on the fruits of India as we continue. Thank you. 
I want to begin by saying thank you. This congregation and there are individuals here who support the work. We appreciate very much your continued support of this work. I can't even begin to imagine what life would be like in India if we as Americans did not send them support. There are several of us here this evening that have been to India and visited and know firsthand if they didn't receive help from us, I don't know that they would be as strong as they are, would continue to live and thrive as they do in the situations and the circumstances they live in. A preacher will live on $50, $50 for a month. And in many places out in the country in the rural areas, they may have a table up front and the offering that day as the Christians come forward to give of their means, they may only have a bowl of rice to give. How do they do that as preachers, as Christians, live in such a manner? We can't imagine because we live in a land of plenty. And so we are very thankful for your continued support because they'll continue to need it and they'll continue to need it and boy are they very, very thankful and are they at, ever at work. They're not lazy people at all. And I will tell you about the flood support and I've just mentioned that. They did not come to me and say, brother, we need help. I heard about it and I went to them and said, how can we help? They won't even ask us for help. That's the kind of people they are. And so we want to help them because we see their need, not because they said, hey, we need help, but because we see a need and we want to help in that need. In April, we went to India. It was my first time to go. I was a school teacher for a long time. And so I guess since about 2002, either I was in college or I was teaching, and my father always wanted me to go. I knew who Jack was for a long time and always wanted me to go on the trip. But you can't tell the principal, I need to be gone for three weeks in November. I won't fly. I won't work. Some of your school teachers, you know, you, unless you're retiring, you really can't go in the middle of school year and say, I need three weeks off. And so it didn't work out. And summer times, you don't make a trip. It's too hot. It was too hot in April. But we went, and people still came out. So imagine trying to go in June and July. It's either the rainy season and floods, or it's 130 degrees. So we went April the 18th to the 28th. The most important thing about that is you see the number there, 394 conversions. We visited 38 villages, 394 conversions. In one village alone, the big tent meeting, a bunch of preachers, there's no telling how many villages they had traveled from. There were 143 conversions, and in one instance the gospel was preached. And these are not people who had heard the gospel for the first time. Most of them had been studied with by a preacher or a Christian in their village, and they invited them and said, let's go and listen to a preacher. And so, they, okay, let's go. And so they'll go and they'll sit. And in one instance, they had been there since 10 o'clock in the morning. We couldn't make it until 6.30 at night. And they had been sitting, waiting for us. Some of the Indian preachers had preached, but they were waiting and we arrived at 6.30 and the gospel was preached. In November, we'll plan to go back to the Lord Wills on the 7th to the 17th for our second trip this year. That's quite unique. We normally don't make two trips, but the first trip was for special introductory for me. But when we go in November, Brother Steve Draper, one of my elders, and there's potentially another man who may be going with us. There'll be two, at least two of us going in November, and we'll try to get out to further areas. The weather will be more, it'll be nicer. It'll be 85 degrees, not 105 degrees. And then you see at the bottom, September the 1st, that's coming up very quickly. Brother John and Sister Indira will come. Brother John is our contact. His father, Brother B. Ratnam, one of the first converts in India in the late 60s, early 70s, was an instrumental figure in that work. His reputation as a good man, a man who stood for what's right, who brought glory to God and not to himself, paved the way for Brother John and many others to continue that great work. We went to one village, and the village president, you might call him, is a Hindu, very big man. But he, I guess, gave us approval. We don't need man's approval, but he, he was there when we preached, and there were about 800 to 1,000 people. And he said, you are welcome to do what you are doing here because you help the orphans and you help the widows. And it's because of the reputation of the Ratnams and the things they're doing, the work that you're a part of in India that paves the way for things to happen. They'll be here. And we're hoping to maybe set something up. We can come visit you and some more information will be shared with you later on that. Here's a picture of the team. There I am with my sunglasses on. Very bright in India, very sunny. 
Above me there, pictured in, in the blue shirt, is Brother John Anon. He wanted to come to PTP. He wanted to be here. That was his dream, to come to PTP. But he could not get an interview for a visa in India. He tried in several places, but he could not do so. If the Lord wills in 2023 does come around and there's a PTP, he'll be here next year. And we'll make plans to maybe come and visit. That might work out. The very bottom in the middle is Brother John Ratnam. To his left, our right, is Sister Indira. And they'll both come, Lord wills. They're going to bring one of their daughters. They're standing there behind them. Becky is going to be attending the University of North Texas to receive her master's in business administration. The other daughter, Lenora, is going to be a heart doctor. The little girl pictured up there in the red shirt, I have no idea who she is. She just jumped in the picture. See, children in India love to have their pictures taken. And everywhere we went, they wanted their pictures taken, many of them because they'd never seen a cell phone before. So you take their picture with a cell phone and show it to them, and they were excited. And you go preaching at a location, and those who have cell phones, they want to take your picture. And everybody, children included, want to have their picture taken. So she jumps into the picture. We weren't going to tell her no. I think she might be a niece. But she jumped in the picture. You see Brother Jack, and then my father is down there in the bottom. He first went in 2002, and he said, I want you to go with me someday. And 20 years later, we were able to go together. And he just told me recently, he said, I think I have one more in me. So I don't know that he's ready to go this November, but maybe next November. He's 70 years old, and he still wants to go. And I'm very happy about that because he loves India. My mother loves India. And so we're, we're, we're glad to be able to go together. We have goals every year. You're familiar with that. Uh, we've been sharing the goals for a long time. Bibles, our goal is $100,000 in Bibles. Something I learned in India Something that I really already knew, but I really learned it when I saw it, was how many people just couldn't read. They couldn't read, especially when you go out in the more rural places. They just can't read. They don't have song books because they can't read. And some have Bibles. And so you say, well, what do you do with all the Bibles that people can't read? One instance was shared with us. They said there was a widow, a Christian, who couldn't read, but she receives a Bible. When someone comes forth and they, they confess Jesus Christ and want to put him on in baptism, they're given a Bible and a song book. And they don't question, when they go into village to do evangelistic work, they don't question if someone in that village or that market can read. They're going to give them a Bible, just as you and I would do. But this widow couldn't read, but she didn't let that Bible go to waste. She went to her grandchildren, and she asked her grandchildren to read it to her. And as they read to her, she said, mark that scripture, and they put a mark on the paper. And what did she do? She took that Bible in which she herself could not read, and she showed it to her friends and said, read this passage. Now flip over here and now read this passage by marking the page. That's just one instance of what they do with Bibles even though they can't read. Bicycles, very important for preachers. Our goal is 15000 That's $100 a bicycle. That's a lot of bicycles. We're already over 13000 in funds for bicycles. That's a big deal for a preacher. He'll travel from village to village. He may preach in four locations on the Lord's Day. And they're sitting and waiting for him. So it's pouring down rain. He's riding in that bicycle, and sometimes he'll have a PA system. You'll see the PA system there for $150. It is a very nice PA system. You could not buy it in the States for $150. It would probably be four or $500. It has Bluetooth, has USB you can plug into it. It's battery powered. It's very nice. Wireless microphone, very nice system. And they're putting that on the back of the bicycle, and they're traveling from village to village preaching. But during the week, they're pushing it along in the village, and they're preaching on that microphone. And they're as loud as can be on the microphone, so everyone in the village will hear. The other PA system is $250. That goes on the outside of the church building. Imagine if you heard Don or Ben preach, and there was no microphone. The preacher said, we're not going to have a microphone. The elders said, we're not going to have microphones. We're going to put it on the outside of the building. They'd make do. It'd work, because you do in India. And their PA systems, they might have them in the building, but they're putting them on the outside so that people in the villages can't help but hear the gospel. And it works. We're from the Church of Christ there, and we just want to know if you want a Bible study. Yes, I've been listening to the sermons. I'd be interested. And it worked. They converted a widow, or excuse me, a woman in Hinduism. Wells and baptistries in the very remote locations. I mentioned there are many remote locations. You may be on a village at the top of a mountain, and the only way up is a dirt path. 
And so sometimes they don't have adequate water. They don't have a baptistry to immerse individuals. And it's not wise to say, well, let's travel several miles down till we find that creek. And maybe there's water there. There's not always water where you think there is. Maybe they're walking a few kilometers and they're getting their water from a spring. So what's the best thing? Dig a well until they find water and then they can fill up a baptistry. And that's the purpose of it. And our goal is to put as many wells, as many places as the kingdom continues to spread. We want to find places that need them and put them there. Church buildings. We build two-level church buildings, um, cement or concrete floor block. And then the second floor is also the same way. The preacher may live on the bottom floor, and the congregation will meet up top. You'll see pictures in a second of what that looks like. And so those buildings will last a long time. It is expensive. There are people who come to say to me, I thought church building used to be $4,500. That was true when things were cheaper in India, but they're not cheap, as cheap anymore. So $10,000 still to build a building where a preacher can live and the local congregation can meet, not too bad. The church has a printing press. We print materials. You think of it, they're going to print it. Especially things from here in the States we've been given permission to use. Sister Becky Honeycutt's book, several of you ladies have probably read those books. They print those for the women over there so that they can read those books and they can use those in their studies. There are two different preaching schools. I wish you could see the preaching school at Tooney because they have very nice charts on the wall, many things they've been given permission from here in the States to use. And they print them on the printing press. They'll give that material to the preachers. They have it on the wall. It's a very nice preaching school. And it, I, I'm very thankful that the church has a printing press. The problem is not that we can't meet our goal. It's the problem is they want to print materials each month. Can you imagine the elders here, oh, our track rack's low. Let's just get online and we'll order and they'll send us some more. They don't do that in India. They can't. They go to the printing press. But the problem is we don't always have funds each month to send to pay the workers, they don't work for free, and to print the materials. So our goal is to try to send $4,000. That's what they've asked us. They need to pay the men, that's $2,500, and print $1,500 in materials. So they may go three or four months without any funds, and then when they get funds again, they'll print. And of course, at the end of the year, we meet our goals. But they want to be able to do that each month. Imagine if they were able to do that. Imagine if they were continually sending out the Back to the Bible series. My brother Rob Whitaker uses, and you probably used it before. We have permission to print those. The other is the second school in which we help support, and that's the Herald School of Biblical Instruction. It's a school specifically divine, des designed to teach men who were denominational preachers. Just um, a week and a half ago, Brother John Ratton was going down to a location. He said, Brother, I'm going to be able to preach to about 30 to 40 denominational preachers. This is not a conference where anybody and everybody can stand up and preach. The church doesn't do that. But he had the opportunity to speak to these men. They would listen to him. He taught them the truth. And he said, brother, there weren't 40 people there. There were 93 denominational preachers there. Many of those men will be converted to the truth because they've never heard the truth before. And when they hear it, they say, I want to be a part of the Lord's church. And those men need to be educated. And they become Christians and they want to preach and that's what that school's for. They're short of their budget and that's a full school. You'll see a picture later. Fruits of India, Luke 6, 43 and 44. Luke says in the context that it's the Sermon on the Plain. It mimics very much the Sermon on the Mount. I believe there were two different instances. Jesus didn't change his teaching. He didn't preach one way for a certain type of people and then preach another way. He might not have said the same things. In Luke's, Jesus does not specifically say it's about false teachers. But in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 and following, he specifically says, beware of false teachers. And he says, you'll know them by their fruits. I believe the principle is still the same. When we're in India, what are we doing? We're trying to preach, exhort, help, convert souls. But we're watching. We're looking to see what's going on. We share in the responsibility because we're sending funds, they're using them, to be able to come back and to tell the elders, yes, they were used appropriately. Yes, the funds are being used appropriately. And so as we jump from Luke 6, 43 and 44, we'll share several points in the fruits of India. Jesus' words, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit. Well, yes, Jesus, everybody would understand that. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. 
For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. Jesus is speaking to an audience, no doubt, that if they were not working in the vineyards, if they were not working in the orchards, they certainly knew about it. And they understood a good tree produces good fruit. In another instance, Jesus is speaking about the vine. If the vine is not producing, it's cut off and it's thrown into the fire. They understood what it meant to produce good fruit. I believe it's fair to say that Jesus is speaking about individuals, whether false teachers or followers of Jesus Christ. A good Christian, a sound Christian, a righteous Christian is going to produce good fruits. A sound congregation, a righteous congregation, an obedient congregation is going to produce good fruits. And as Paul pins in Galatians 6, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. We sow to the flesh, we'll of the flesh reap corruption. We sow to the Spirit, we shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. God cannot be tricked. Men can, but God cannot be. A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree cannot. And so with those passages in mind, let us consider several points about fruits of India. The first is fruits of worship. John 4, 24, Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman. Remember, she's a Samaritan, and she says, who, who are you to come, a man and a Jew to come and ask me for water? And remember that conversation? He tells her, I can provide you everlasting water, spiritual water, something far greater than this water in this well. And so he's piqued her interest. And then as that conversation continues on about worship, she says, we worship in the mountain, you worship in Jerusalem. And he says, there's a time coming where there won't be a designated place. God is seeking those who will worship him, true worshipers. And so John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter if it's the first century or in this century. It doesn't matter if it's in America or in India. God expects us to worship in spirit and in truth. The right attitude and the right means that he has given us example. Colossians 3, 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply means this. If Jesus has authorized it, that's what we should be doing. If we say or do, it should be because of the authority of Jesus Christ. And so with those two things in mind, we think about worship. Very simple. We understand there are five acts of worship. We can read and clearly understand the first century church. Those are the things that they did. So what about in India? You see the man pictured there on the left? That is the second floor of a two-story church building. It's not a super fancy building. There are ceiling fans. But in most instances, those ceiling fans are not turned on because Indians don't sweat. I saw one Indian sweat. Indians just don't sweat. So you're standing there, and really you're not far off the ground. You'd be about that far above the ground. And there's a ceiling fan right there. In that building, it wasn't so. But there were several buildings for 6'4 standing there, and the ceiling fan is literally right here. And they feel that they must turn it on for the Americans. And I said, no, brother, no. And then they have a fan over to the side they turn on. So you're standing there trying to preach, and the ceiling fan above your head is going to chop your head off. And the fan's blowing from the side, and your pages are just turning, and you're doing everything you can to hold your pages down and hold the microphone. It was fun. <laughs> that man's standing there with a microphone, and they are singing praises to God. There's not a songbook in sight. No one there has probably ever seen a note. They don't know that alto, soprano, tenor, and bass even exist. And to hear the singing, it was beautiful to God, no doubt, because they weren't concerned about how they sounded. They didn't look to each other and say, oh, your voice is terrible, or they didn't lower their head and whisper. They were singing, and by our standard and by our judgment, it was not unified, it was not beautiful, it was not in harmony, but it doesn't matter what you and I think. We're to worship God from the heart. The heart, the instrument in which we're supposed to use is the heart. And we're supposed to sing and to admonish and edify one another. And we saw that at every location we went to. And I wish so much that you could go to India and you could hear it. I wish you could go and see the smiles on their faces and the joy that they have. And they worship God. Picture there on the table, we went to one location in Rampa. It's a very large building. I'll show you a picture in a second. And I saw those nets and I said, well, they must have a problem with butterflies. Those are like butterfly nets. So maybe the butterfly is getting the building and they catch them and carry them out. No, that's not a butterfly net. That's the collection net. Doesn't look like what you and I would use. 
We wouldn't walk into a church building now and have feed bags sewn. We wouldn't be sitting on the ground. The elderly sit in the chairs in the back. You can probably see in that picture. It doesn't look like a church building. The worship doesn't necessarily look like what ours would look like, but are they singing praises? Are they praying? Are they partaking of the Lord's Supper, giving of their means, what little means they do have, and are they opening up the Word of God and speaking and studying from it? Absolutely. This was in Rampa. There's the nets there at the bottom. You see that, the collection nets. Worship began at 10 that morning. We didn't finish until 1145. The preacher went a long time. No one fell asleep. When they were singing, we could hear the tunes and understood the words. So I'm trying to sing in English the verses I could remember. But they're singing, and I saw everyone singing. Everyone's mouths were open. And they were all joined together in singing praises to God. There's no instrument being played but that of the heart. When it came time for the Lord's Supper, they're doing the individual cups. They're still doing that in India. Now think about it. there's six to eight hundred people there. It's better to do it in individual cups. So they're taking the Lord's Supper. They take their time. Scripture's being read. Several men are involved in prayer. It was just nice and calm and slow and thoughtful process. The young people are sitting in the top. High school age, college age. Nobody was playing on their cell phone. A few of them have phones. No one's playing on their phone. They're not elbowing each other and laughing, goofing off and talking. No one fell asleep. You don't see people get up in mass exit, run out over this way, got to go to the bathroom, and walking out here. It was just really nice to see are our brothers and sisters. They're doing the same things that you and I are doing in worship to God. What really struck me, though, when it came time for the offering, because I know those people don't have much at all. Every single person that I could see put something in that net. Every single person. And I'm a benefit of sitting up there on the, on the stage and being able to see everyone. Every single person put something in that net. For many of them, it was just a few coins, probably not more than 25 cents. But when Jesus talks about the widow who gave all she had and she gave two mites, that's what we were seeing. That may be all they had and they saved it so that they were there on the Lord's day. They were worshiping God and giving of their means. And of course, you and I are not heart judgers, but the fruits were there. The evidences were there. We heard them sing praises. We heard the prayers. We saw them take the Lord's Supper to give up their means and then to open up the Word of God and study. It was very, very nice to be there that day. That's not about how we feel when we leave. It's about worship to God. And I was glad to be there. And there were definitely fruits of worship in India. The next fruits of benevolence. Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity. We don't always have the opportunity. But as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all, especially those of the household of faith. We have scriptural authority to help those who are not Christians, but our focus, our attention to be on those of the household of faith. So in India, what are we doing? Helping those who are not Christians? I could speak for hours upon the need and the necessity for continued benevolent work in India. We have the need here, but they definitely need it there. There are about 60 children there. If that home was not there available for them, they would likely be on the street, or many of them probably would have died from malnourishment. That's not an exaggeration. Many years ago, Brother B, when he was still living, brought home one day. He saw five children on the street. They had no parents, had no home. He brought them home. He didn't ask Sister B, can we start an orphanage? He brought them home and said, we must do something. The Indian government doesn't do anything. They actually like it to see that the church is doing so because they don't have any social system. And so those children are provided a place. The so James 1.27 is fulfilled in India. James writes and says, Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, that you visit the fatherless and widows and their affliction, and you keep yourself unspotted from the world. That word visit means you see to their needs, not just going, how are y'all doing? I know th times are tough, but to do something about it. And so the fruits of benevolence are very clear in India. Picture there at the top, I know it looks like there's not much to the picture, but I wanted you to see the livestock. There are goats, and there are chickens, and they have a cow there. And that orphanage is out in the country a good ways. They're not really close to a market. It's not feasible for them to walk to the market every day, so 
They said, look, it would be better for us in this land that we have to have fruit trees. Those are cashew trees you see there. Let's have some goats. Let's have some chickens and some cows so that we can try to do everything we need here. The church building, I know it's hard to see, but the church building is that white building in the background. And that's a pretty big compound. There's an orphanage, a widow's home, and the church building there in that area. And so they're trying to live there. You see a picture there at the bottom. That's the kitchen at the top and then the orphanage to the right. And outside on the ground, the chalk drawing. And we got there and I said, that's, that's great. The children are out here drawing and they've taken pride and they appreciate what they have. And they said, this, right here on this dirt. And, and Brother John said, Brother, that, that's not dirt. It's not dirt. It looks like dirt. He says, oh, no, brother. He says, that's cow dung, cow urine and clay mixed together. See, the orphans and the widows walk barefooted, and you see the livestock, the chickens, the goats, the cows, they're walking around and defecating wherever they feel like it. And so someone, someone said, let's do something to help the widows and the orphans. And so they mixed those things together and literally got their hands dirty and made that paste and put it down on the ground. And it's a hardened paste. And I was surprised. I said, why? He said, brother, antifungal properties. They walk barefooted on it. They're not likely to transmit things that would affect their feet and their skin. And I came home and I researched it, and absolutely, they do that in many places in India. But that's the resourcefulness of an orphanage and a widow's home. You see a picture there on the left. Those are the beds inside that same location. They sleep on a blanket. Some of them have mattresses, but many of the children and the widows, they don't want to sleep on the mattress. They choose to sleep on the metal bed, and they'll sleep on top of the blanket. Picture there on the right, that's the inside view of the kitchen. That's the food they have. They either grew that food or they bought it at the market probably earlier that day. They cook outside. It's rice and some type of curry, chicken curry, vegetable curry. And so those children and orphans are being fed. An orphan's fed for $10. That money for a month, $10 goes towards a widow to help feed her. An orphan, $25. Because the orphans have school uniforms and school supplies and and other things that children would need that the widows don't necessarily have needs of. But that's what it looks like in orphans and widows' home. Benevolent work. That lady pictured there on the left, 90 years old. 90 years old. They said, brother, she does not miss a widow's prayer meeting. And she has memorized many scripture. I said, that's outstanding. 90 years old. She's been able to live a long time. She can't read. She's been a faithful Christian for who knows how many years. I don't know how long she's been without a husband, but because of that home, she's been able to live and thrive and to grow as a Christian, and the woman can't read. Many of the widows there have memorized things like Psalm 119, all of Psalm 119. They spend their time in devotion, and the safe place is provided for them. Picture to the bottom right, you'll see that woman squatted down on the ground. She didn't lose something. She can't stand I didn't take a picture of her feet. It wouldn't be appropriate. Her feet were severely deformed. There's no system. There's no government aid. There's nothing for her there. She has no one to take her in and help her but the orphan's home or the widow's home. And so where's the benevolent funds going to to help women like that? A Christian woman who has no other means but the help that's provided for her. You see the woman at the bottom there, she's in a village and they've gone and they've likely given her a New Testament. You can't see very well in the picture, but a few pieces of fruit and they're trying to talk to her and to convert her to Christ. Standing over the top are sewing machines. Those are provided for younger widows, widows who have the means to take care of themselves or they may have their own home. They can't just go down to the store and get a job anywhere unless their family's involved in the business and they work with their family. But those women, they're widows, They'll never remarry. The Bible gives us clear, clear, clear instructions that a woman can remarry, but their culture says no. So even though they're very young, they'll never remarry. So how do they take care of themselves? That sewing machine. They can make clothes for themselves and for their children, and they can sell those clothes and make a living. But I want you to pay close attention to that widow standing right in the middle. At one point, she was right in front of me, and she had flowers in her hair, and it was, smelled beautiful. And I tried to communicate to her point and smell good, and she turned to me and signaled to me that she cannot hear. She's deaf. And Sister Indira, Brother John's wife, said, Brother, she is deaf. She cannot hear. I don't know that she can read or write. If she can write, then she can write, obviously communicate. No one there knew sign language. And she said, Brother, her father was very sick with COVID. 
and her brother was going to visit and on his bicycle, and as he's going along, a tree fell on top of him and killed him. And then her father died sometime later from COVID. A widow who will never marry again. Her brother is dead. Her father is dead. That sewing machine makes a huge difference in her life. And I was very thankful to be there that day and to be able to give those to them. Benevolent work in action. And the last point, the fruits of excuse me, evangelism. Mark 16, 15, and 16, we're very familiar with the instructions of Jesus to go into all the world. To go into all the world means India, Africa, Asia, wherever it may be. The street that you live on. The house two blocks over. A co-worker you've been next to for years and maybe never spoken to them about the Bible. We're familiar with that passage. What about 2 Timothy 2.2? 2, 2? Paul writes to Timothy and he says, The things that thou hast heard of me amongst many witnesses... The same commit thou to faithful men that they may do so likewise. What about the gospel? What about the things that you and I did as Christians? So simple to hear a believer repent, confess, be baptized. To know that there is but one church and God adds us to that church when we submit to his will and we have the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins. What about the acts of worship that you and I can read about? Can we take those same things that we've heard and we've studied and we've been obedient to and go to the person right next to us and say, let me show you. That widow did who couldn't read. I know that we can. Picture there at the top, those three men, that one on the right with the cream-colored shirt. We saw him that Sunday morning. And many times when you see a man at the front at a preacher's meeting, they're preachers, and they come sit at the front and they'll have a Bible in their hand. And I said, oh, there's a preacher. And we're sitting up here and he stands up on the invitation is being offered, and the man next to him in the blue shirt, I elbow my father, said, look, that preacher has brought his brother. You can clearly see they look alike. After the invitation and worship was over, we went outside to the baptistry, come to find out that man was not a Christian. And yes, those are his biological brothers. And they said, brother, we have studied with that man for many, many times, and we never thought he'd become obedient to the gospel. But that day... Not only was he obedient to the gospel, but he had taught his brothers. And his brothers were also obedient to the gospel. Three biological brothers are now our brothers in Christ. Evangelism in action. Someone was patient with that man. Someone was long-suffering with that man. And they never gave up on him. And that day, we just happened to be there. And man, you're talking about joy in your heart, and you see those men, and you realize, those are my brothers. And they're actual biological brothers. Picture at the bottom, that was the location I'd mentioned, the mayor or the governor of the city. You see all those individuals there? Someone studied with them. Someone brought them for miles and miles to be there in that hot sun, and it was hot. Jack couldn't stand it. My father couldn't stand it. It was so hot underneath that tent, they went over to the side, and I took a picture of them. They had two fans on them over there. And Brother John and I up there preaching, and all, we were oh, sweating. That was the only Indian I ever saw sweat was Brother John. And we're just sitting there, they're sweating. When the invitation's extended, they don't sing a song of invitation. I'll be finished preaching. Jack's finished preaching. My father's finished preaching. And what happens? The Indian translator may go on for five, ten more minutes. And he may say things, especially if he knows individuals, and he may point to someone and say, I know that you know what the Scriptures say. I know that you study the Bible, and you know what you need to do to become a Christian. Quite different than what would happen here. Someone would be offended if they were called out and stated that. Sister so-and-so, you know you need to repent. You're living in sin, and I'm glad you're here today, but you need to repent. If that took place now, people would be so angry, but that's what's happening in India. Evangelism. I know the bell, second bell rang, didn't it? Okay. I could barely hear the bell. I still have five more minutes, right? Okay. I will. Paul's right there.
Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Our song is going to be number 990. 990. We'll sing, we'll sing through this song twice. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise you. Invitation song will be 634, first, second, and fourth stanza. As we concluded our presentation during the Bible class time, we were talking about the fruits of evangelism, and we had looked at Luke chapter 6, verses 43 and 44. And I titled the presentation the fruits of India because I couldn't help but think of what Jesus said about fruit production. In Matthew's context, we talked about he's talking about false teachers. And certainly this would fit for false teachers. When we're there, are we seeing that there's any false teaching? Yes, there's false teaching everywhere. But are we walking in and saying there's blatantly an error and against what the Word of God says? No, we weren't seeing it. Sometimes you and I can't see it and we don't know. That should be the alarming thing for us as Christians. We can sit next to one another every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We can be together during the week for youth events and get-togethers and meals, and we can know each other and feel like we know each other so well that we say, I know, I know that they're a faithful Christian. But their heart may be far from God. And Jesus quoting from Isaiah, said to you hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, they honoreth me with their lips, they draw to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And that is the concern that we should always have. Is my heart right? Am I just putting on a show? Am I looking good on the outside? And as we talked about fruit trees in the context of Luke 6, 43 and 44, and Jesus is speaking about a good tree will produce good fruit. Well, yes, Jesus, we know that. We know that now, even with the fruit trees in our yards, in our garden. We know a good tree produces good fruit. Several months ago, well, earlier in the spring, I heard a woman saying, my apple tree had blossoms come out, and they just all fell off, and nothing came out of it. Bad tree, because there's no good fruit being produced. Can we apply that to the Christian life? Can we say that maybe there's someone here this evening that's pretending to look like a good tree, that's trying to look like they're a faithful Christian and serving God, that they're coming and they're saying and doing the right things, and by all means, everyone looks and says they're a faithful Christian. No, we're not heart judges. We can't dig down into the heart and see the heart of men and women, but God can. And although we may fool on the outside, and although the tree might look good, are we producing fruits that we should? We talked about three aspects in the India work. We talked about the fruits of worship. We talked about the fruits of benevolence and the fruits of evangelism. What fruits are you producing this evening as a Christian? In verse 45 of that same chapter 6, Jesus says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. Notice it, good, 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 evil, evil, evil. The truth of the matter is there's not a third tree. There is no tree that sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. It coincides with what Jesus said. 
in Revelation 3 about Laodicea. I'd rather you be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Rather you be hot or cold, one or the other. And so either we're the good tree, or we're doing everything we can to be faithful to God and serve Him, and we're trying to produce fruits, we're trying to do what's right, so that men may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Not to make a list, a tally list, to show everybody, look how faithful I am, look at all the things that I've done. That's not what it's about. You and I are either a good tree, or sadly we're an evil tree. Jesus doesn't speak of a third. So this evening, even though we may look around and you may not know what's in my heart and I may not know what's in your heart, God knows what kind of tree are you this evening. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 3 was speaking to those who had heard John the baptizer out in the wilderness, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And they were uh, not really listening to what John had to say, but Jesus and John both preparing for the coming kingdom. And Jesus said in John Excuse me, Matthew 3, verse 8, he says, You must bear fruits worthy of repentance. If one truly wants to be the tree that God wants them to be and produce the fruit that God wants them to produce, but they're not doing so correctly, they must be willing to repent and to bear fruits worthy of repentance. See, it must not be, I'm so sorry for what I've done. I feel bad for the sin in my life. I know that I've not been doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and that's a part of it. But godly sorrow worketh repentance not to be repented of. So this evening, you want to be a good tree. You want to produce fruits. You want to be faithful to God but you know you haven't been, we'll be willing to pray with you and pray for you. The passage in James hasn't changed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You must recognize they'll be willing to repent, confess your sins, and we'll pray with you and pray for you. And this evening you can leave and know God sees me as a good tree and I'm going to produce good fruits. What about those who are not trees at all? If you're not a Christian, what if you're not a child of God? Galatians 3, 26 and following makes it very clear. We are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I can't claim to be a tree and faithfully serving him if I've never put on Christ in baptism. So I must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I must be willing to repent of sins, to change my heart and mind, to live for myself no longer for the world no longer, to follow what men say no longer, but to do what God says, to do it His way, and to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then as Jesus very plainly said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not will be condemned. Do you want to be a tree, a righteous, faithful tree? We can help you as a Christian, or if you're not a Christian, we can help you become one this evening. And the time now is yours to come while we stand and sing. The great physician now is here, the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the truth, be hard to cheer. Oh, hear the voice of Jesus.
Good evening. We'd like to welcome everybody to our Bible study this evening. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. We hope you come back and are with us anytime you have an opportunity to do that. We have a few announcements for the congregation. Mike Dyer remains in Cookville Regional Medical Center. As was mentioned earlier, Justin Demps, brother of Kathy Whitaker, was injured in an automobile accident this morning and was airlifted to Erlanger. Young professionals, please remember your game night on Friday, August 26th at 6 p.m. and please check the bulletin board for details. Bible Bowl practice this Sunday is at 4.30 and Bible Bowl is Saturday, September 10th. Care groups, please check your team's clipboard on the desk in the foyer for contacts for this month. And then concerning the Kentucky flood relief, the Willow Avenue congregation will be coordinating monetary donations to help in relief of many Eastern Kentucky families devastated by recent flooding. Donations will be accepted through Sunday, August 28th, and will be sent to our sister congregation in Richmond, Kentucky for distribution. Please get those to the office or to one of the elders. Then we have a request from the elders that they would like to meet with all the teenage parents and any other members who are interested in helping with the teen ministry after evening services on Sunday, August 21st in classroom number 14. And finally, we'd like to encourage everyone to please check your bulletin for additional details on activities and other items of interest. And if you would please stand for our closing prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to gather as your children tonight, Father, during this midweek Bible study and, and study a little bit more of your word, Father, and listen to the presentation of the work that's going on for the church in India. We're thankful for that work, Father, and we pray that you will bless that work and continue to uh, be a shining light for so many who, who need to know you. Father, we're thankful for our lives. We're thankful for the blessings that you give us. Father, we're thankful for your son, for it is without him that we would have no hope. Father, we pray that we will strive as your children to live a faithful Christian life, to bear great fruit from the branches of our lives. Father, may this world see us as a shining example. May we be a beacon to those who have no hope. And may they ask us, where does our hope come from? And we can tell them it is from you. Father, we ask that you would help us to be strong, help us to be live a life of courage in this world. And Father, we ask that even though we realize we're not perfect, we, we know we can have forgiveness of our sins, and we ask you, Father, to forgive us of our sins. And Father, for those who have been mentioned recently with loss of loved ones, those who are dealing with illnesses and difficult situations with family members. We pray that you will give them a special blessing and tender care. Be with us, Father, as we go our separate ways this evening. May we once again come together as a church family on Sunday to worship thee. And it's through your son's precious name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>